Wasn't it? Prepared that myself. Didn't show all the opposition tries. He probably lost both those games. It's not true. I feel intimidated here because Andrew's got his big motorbike. I, didn't bring, I should have brought a rugby ball or something over this side, shouldn't I? But it's um. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. I haven't uh, been to a Promise Keepers event before, so just correct me as I go along. Um, has anyone got any questions for me to start? Uh, by the way, has anyone here written a letter of the editor complaining about me? <laughs> I know there's a few of you out there. I want to um, please interrupt me at any stage. Um, and I guess I've seen this as a chance to, I guess I've been asked to come here and, and share my testimony, to share a little bit about my job as a, as a, as a rugby coach and I guess how I deal with that. So... Keep me honest in my comments, please. I want to start at the end to make it real simple for you. And it's actually a scripture, Hebrews 12, verse 1. A lot of you may know this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. So if that's the end of my story, what do you think my story's about? Help me out. Running a race? Yep. Come on, you've just had dinner. Coming disentangled, yep. Perseverance. It's not a very popular quality now, is it? It's all about what you can get out of the here and now, and if that doesn't work, move on to something else. It's a bit tough when you're in the middle of the campaign, lost a few games, you just can't walk out the door and forget about it. Faith. Cool. Looking to Jesus. Keeping the eye on the prize. On the author of the prize. Cool. That's a little bit about my story. So you've got me pretty well sorted. Um, I'm here because I've got a very interesting job. Would that be fair? Who wants it? It's my last year. Who thinks they could do it better than me? Come on. You're supposed to be honest. Okay. I'll remind you when you give me advice later. Um, <clears throat> I work in a reasonably pressured environment. And... I know I'm not the only one in this room that does that. And it's quite interesting that everyone tells me they wouldn't want my job, that dealing with the pressure and the intensity that's under. But I keep thinking, I'm quite glad I'm not a surgeon. I'm quite glad I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a plumber who's got a broken pipe and you've got someone screaming at you saying they want it fixed. Everyone's got pressure in their jobs, haven't they? So mine's just a little bit different than yours, probably. But I understand that everyone's 
got things to deal with in their lives. Um, what I'm searching for as a coach is we analyse our games. In our games, our, my team will do 1,400 tasks a game. So what that means is after the game, I can go on my laptop and I can click on Richard Carr, who is left shoulder tackles, his right foot chip kicks, and it gives me the video, tells me how many times he does them, and it codes them as good or bad. I can click on any player and get whatever task I want up there. Over a game, there's 1,400 tasks. Over a season, it's 1,400 tasks times 16 games times 15 teams. We calculate all that. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? And last season, the top team, skill-wise, did 86% of those tasks good. What did the bottom team do, do you think? 20%? That's a bit low. So the answer was 83%. So who can add up the difference? Anyone who's really smart here? The difference is 3%. So what do I do as a coach? I try to find 3%. I'm searching for 3% in my industry. And I'm pretty sure that in a lot of your industries, the margin of error is pretty small too between success and failure. So what I'm looking for is how can I get this group of people to find that little extra to get something out of it. And um, clearly you could say right now I'm not doing a great job. But the fact is it, it's a tough, it's a, there's, a, there's a tough line through that and there's a lot of little variables that affect that. But when you're a coach, what, what I'm trying to do is I'm in an industry that the, the the bar's been raised. We've got professionalism, professionalism has changed the way players prepare right across all the different countries. We're in, in a competition with the most travel out of any regional competition in the world in any sport. The, um, no, there's no other sport you travel halfway around the world to play the next Saturday and then come back and play the next Saturday here. So there's a whole range of things in terms of that we have to deal with, but that's the margin of error that we're working for. And so, you feel sorry for me yet? <laughs> I, um, I'm a humble coach, but I've got 14 in my management team, and I've got 40 players. And that doesn't count the, the, the marketing, that side of the operation. So therefore, what I enjoy is blowing a whistle and bossing people around, like we're in the pitches, and sitting in my box and screaming at players. But reality is, is it's an, it's an organisation of 55 people. And so if you think about what it takes to run that and the, the psychology and the organisational structure, it's actually a little bit more than just doing those little things. We've got, of the 40 players, our key 20 players are paid a lot more than me. Believe that? And quite frankly, if we don't win and they're not happy, guess who gets sacked? Because it's much easier to chop one off than it is to chop five very, very highly paid players because you can't replace them. <laughs> That's why you don't want me to drop them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Also within that, every week, we have a reward system, don't we? And it's called selection. And how many players are on the field at any one time? 15. So, so if we're dealing with just success and failure and it's, and it's judged on how people see our, our industry, then every week out of my main squad of 32, I've got 17 guys that have failed. And if you think about that as a, as a coach, one of the key things that I obviously have to do, one of the key challenges is to redefine what success and failure is. Because clearly it can't always be for everyone been on the park doing what they're doing. So there must be other motivational things that we've got to tag into. Um, I've been there a while. This is my eighth season. So believe it or not, I'm about to become the third longest serving super rugby coach, which makes me at 45 feel very old. 
I'm incredibly stubborn. And the verse I gave you was about perseverance, wasn't it? So I, I, I don't know whether I'm really smart or whether I'm silly. But that's a bit of our background. And, and one of the things when you've been there a while <clears throat> is that people forget the past. And all they remember is that you've been there a while. And so we start to lose a few games or we have a few senior players out, a few injuries, playing a few young guys. They don't win. People forget about being in finals a few years ago and all that sort of stuff, and quite rightly so in some ways, but we get judged very much on the here and the now, and it's about performance here and the now, and in some ways that's a really good way to, to keep you motivated. You can't live in the past in this game. And the minute you do, the minute you rest on your laurels, the minute you feel like you've actually succeeded and done something, you end up getting bitten really, really bad. And so we're at, we're at our most dangerous when we're succeeding because that's when complacency comes in. So that's some of the little variables that sort of surround our industry. Um, so what I wanted to share is just a few of my philosophies about how I deal with that. And so, first and foremost, how, how do you deal? With, how will you deal with it when you've had seven games and you've lost five? Anyone give me any help? No. Start winning. That's a good idea. Yep. Don't panic. <clears throat> Look forward. Yeah, well, there's always someone worse, and that's true. Get into the hurricanes at the moment. <laughs> Hallelujah for the hurricanes. <laughs> it's <clears throat> Stay true to your course, and stay true to the planning and the things that you fundamentally believe in. And I think if you, you look about your faith and... Uh, when you're going through tough times, what do you do? And, and I think we all know that if we go, if we stray from the course, that's when things get worse. We're at our most vulnerable when things aren't going well. So where do you go to? You stay true to your course. So what does it mean for a coach? It means that I don't turn into someone who I wasn't when we were winning. It means that when the boys come in the shed afterwards and I see the bitter disappointment on their face is that I don't take my emotions out on them by telling them how frustrated I am. It's about me giving them space to get through that and making sure I'm very, very consistent, that I'm going back and reminding them of our plan. And it's about a, of us making sure that we don't go and, yes, we've got to reevaluate everything, but we've got to make sure that we stay true to the things that we know worked. And not easy to do when you get put under the pressure. It's, um, I just want you to imagine you're all in the Chiefs and you've just played the Blues, who we categorically hate. You're allowed to use that word in the church when it comes to rugby, by the way. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure there's no Blues supporters here who admit to it. <laughs> there's one. <clears throat> yeah, but you're confused because you're actually from here. So most Blues supporters, if they're avid, they're generally confused. So you're the Chiefs players, and you've just lost to the Blues, and this is Monday morning, and you're about to come into the team review. And you've read a couple of comments from me in the media saying that I wasn't happy over the weekend. So I want you to sit the way that you would sit. LAUGHTER what is the key thing you're trying not to do? Never get eye contact with a coach. <laughs> Never, ever. Because you'll be the one on the target. <clears throat> the other thing is that you know that the video that's going to go up there isn't a warm, fuzzy one with me looking. I thought I looked very handsome there, by the way. It's not going to be that sort of video, is it? Because it's actually your life and your job on screen for you to sit and watch with your mates. You imagine if that's what happened to you in your job. And that's the one thing about sport, there is nowhere to hide. And so, 
if I if if I'm not true to course, that that meeting is going to become a growl meeting, isn't it? And what am I going to learn out of that at the end of the day? I'm going to learn nothing. So part of being true to course is that on a Monday when we come and have our review, we call our review meeting a checkpoint. And a checkpoint, for those who have been orienteering, is about get your compass, set your course, go there. When you get to the next marker, you figure out how strong your team is, you figure out whether they're tired, you reset your course, you go again. And reality is that's exactly how we try to approach it because we want people coming and thinking about how we can improve. Because there's no sense of, you don't get a lot of gains out of just hammering people. And so staying true to course, that's our approach. Win or lose, we try to be reasonably consistent in the way that we deal things and try not to drift too far away from it. Second philosophy that I've got is you reward what you value. And I think it's really important as a coach is that I've got to think about the key things that I value and I've got to make sure I'm rewarding them at all times in, in my organisation. And again, I think if you, if you look at your faith, if I look at my faith, I mean, who values prayer here? Is prayer any good for you? So if you really think, if that's one thing that you know that you value, it's important for you, you need to reward that by making sure it's part of your life. If you know that being disciplined in certain aspects of your life is you value that, you think it's really important for you, then it will show, it should show in your behaviour and the way you prioritise things you do during the day. It's the same with, with coaching, is that, see I very seldom show a DVD like you just saw up there, because what was on that DVD? Success. What else? Yep, highlights. So, so primarily, what, what did success look like? Tries. Who's my highest paid players? All Blacks. And the Chiefs haven't got that many of them currently, but they're generally try scorers, aren't they? They're the show ponies, got the flash red boots, Nike Adidas sponsorship. They're in all the magazines. They get the most money because they score the big moments. They've got that skill that's a bit special. The likes of City, Mills, those sort of players. Problem is that if that's what I reward, so that they get all their external rewards because that's part of life. You're not, not too many of the short, fat, strong fellas get the biggest contracts. Generally, they're ugly, they've got funny ears, and quite frankly, their profession is pushing and jumping. It's not bad, is it, for a job? <laughs> but reality is, it's what scored the try, isn't it, that I'm interested in as a coach. So I will seldom show a try being scored in my, in my, in my team meeting, because what I value is the fact that Hicker Elliott might have run from that side of the park to that side of the park so that my nine could pass the ball in front of him to Stephen Donald who gives it to Mills and he scores a try. And the fact that Hicker was there held a defender and created the space. Follow the concept? Think about it in your life. Think about it in your family. If, how often do we as, as dads um, reward the wrong things? How often do we we reward the results, the, the good exam results, the, the winning of a cricket game, a rugby game, a soccer game, whatever, rather than focusing on rewarding the, the values, the, the effort, the study that went into that, the, the, the effort at training and the really good sports conduct and that sort of stuff. And I think it's really important that we really keep focusing on what we value and spend time rewarding that. And I think as a rugby team, we're no different than a family in making sure that we do that. And I think if you look at our faith, or my faith, it's very much about, I've got to keep reminding myself about what, what I really value in my faith, and it's making sure I spend time in his word, making sure that I'm spending time talking to people that keep me on the straight and narrow, and making sure that I factor that into my life and I don't sort of slip, slip up on those sort of areas. Not easy at times. Is it? Please nod your head because I find it hard. And I think the, the other philosophy that I've got that I want to keep driving is, 
is about, is my business about dealing with success or dealing with failure? What, what do I have to be really, really good at? Which one is more important I'm better at? Why? There's more of it. We've only won two games. <laughs> That's not very nice, actually. Yep. So, for example, I'm going to I'm going to boast to you guys because you don't you don't you won't believe me anyway. But it was my eighth season. The first six seasons with the Chiefs, we made the playoffs once. First time we've ever made the playoffs. But in that six years. Um, we were the only team, along with the Crusaders, that always finished in the top half of the championship. Now, you guys wouldn't know that, probably, and the media sure wouldn't tell you. So we'd gone from being a team that was always in the bottom third of the championship to a team that was always in the top 40% of the championship. So that was progress. Two years ago, we made the final first time. Everyone's raving about the Crusaders the last couple of years. They'd never made a final. Doing pretty good right now. <laughs> Play them on Friday. I'm a little bit scared. <laughs> but I need to learn how to deal with failure. And one of the key things is defining it. To making sure I'm really clear that I understand what it's about. And so, is losing a game... You guys understand what failure is for me, don't you? Come on. No, well, well yeah. Don't talk about that. That's come up a few times. You know what failure is for me. Failure is when I lose on the scoreboard. And you watch it, you read it, you look at the next day, those Chiefs are useless. I understand what the world thinks of failure. Internally, I can't think like that. Because I've got to keep going back to the process about what does this team need to improve? How can we get better? And then I've got to look at individual motivation. How can we get better? And so, yes, I know scoreboard results are pivotal in, in our area, but that's the type of thing I've got to understand what failure is. Is it failure for the Chiefs when we have, like the second half of last year, we had about eight of our senior players all in the hospital ward. It was terrible. So I was blooding in all these young fellas. We were losing. So from the, the public standard, yep, we were failing. From internally, I couldn't look at it like that. How do you think I looked at it? Rebuilding. So my job was about how to teach people how to deal with failure and to teach them that failure wasn't actually the scoreboard right now. It will be if we don't learn quickly, but it was about learning what was happening in our life, what was happening in our game, and how could we get better. And failure was that if we didn't start applying some of those lessons... And quite frankly, it's still like that now. It's, it's still, even when you've got a lot of your top players back, we're still a reasonably light international team compared to others. We've got to keep focusing on, keep building and understanding what failure is. Who should be the best people in the world at understanding failure? Christians should be. Why? Ask a lot of questions, eh? Who said Christians? world saw Jesus as a failure? Yep. Yep. What? Yeah, call us losers. We can deal with that, though, can't we? I think it's because of part of who we are in Christ is understanding that, that we have failed. That we have fallen short. And that we have done things that have gone against his will. And if you think about it as a, as a Christian, I should be really good and tolerant of other people's failures because I've got a God who's actually lifted me out of that and can deal with that and is teaching me how to, how to deal with that. And I think that um, it's not always simple knowing that, is it? You've actually got to believe it. And I keep thinking of, I've written a few things down here, so, is that we go through the same adversity in life, whether you're a chief's coach, a plumber, builder, whatever you are, as anyone else. And generally we're not immune from that feeling of being inadequate at times, feeling like we haven't achieved something, 
and being poorly prepared. And often we see other Christians who appear to be better than us and are better prayers, better talkers, better communicators. And sometimes that sort of feeling of not being good enough attacks us at our heart, doesn't it? And we start listening to that voice and that voice starts telling us we're not good enough. And quite frankly, this is exactly what goes on in some rugby players' minds when times get tough and they become their own worst enemies and it goes on in our own faith. And when we're under pressure like that, we've got to learn something really important about making a mistake and about failing. And that is that it's temporary. We are able to turn to God, ask his forgiveness, and ask him to help us learn from that experience, and ask him to get rid of the guilt that for some reason seem, we seem to want to hang on to. There's almost a comfort about it at times. Then we can continue on the path of freedom and becoming the man that God wants us to be. You see how my job helps me understand that concept really, really well. So I want to go back to the start just to finish. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. I want to share very quickly my testimony. I've made a lot of mistakes. I can lose focus at times, but especially when the race I'm running isn't the race that Jesus wants me to run. It's the one that I've designed for myself. Because the race that I, I designed for myself has me winning every time. And it has my team winning. And it has the papers telling everyone how good I am. It's when I seek the glory of the world. I also have times that I prefer to, prefer to walk rather than to run. It's when it gets a bit tough, when the criticism gets up there, things aren't going the way that I want. But I've also learned through all that that keeping Jesus in my sight is a pretty good way for me to keep on track. That's me. 